I'm coming to join us here at Toonwork Studio. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sherman Webb Middlebrooks. I'm a lifelong Buffalo resident and a full-time black man. I work at the Buffalo Center for Health Equity as their program manager for their men's health initiative. Um, I also work for Open Buffalo as a credible community messenger, and I run um, the WIN initiative, which stands for We're Improving Now, which is a subsidy of Mental Rent Media Company. I'm also one third of a collective vision and a whole bunch of other things I got going on, but for right now, that's what I'm going to share. Um, I want to just go around the room and do a check-in with everybody before I bring my panelists up to the front um, for a good conversation. So, the first question I got for the fellas. When you hear men's health, what comes to mind and why is men's health important? Start from the end, work our way down. Oh, man. All right. Uh, when I think men's health, I think uh, what first comes to mind is like... Um, our physical health, uh, heart attacks, um, prostate cancer, um, things of that nature. And then I think it rounds off with uh, mental health. And um, I think that the examples that I've seen in my life have been ones of uh, sacrifice okay. uh, for my family um, and for my family members and sometimes the men and the elders in my family it felt like they may have sacrificed their own personal health and mental health wasn't even a part of the equation and I think I think of how can I do better and how can I be an example to uh, the young men in my life cool. you ask the question one more time yeah so when you hear um Men's health, what comes to mind and why is men's health important? When I, when I hear men's health, I think of mental illness. And I think one of the reasons why um, men's health is so important is because we could just be, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I could be neglectful, right? And I think in a lot of ways that reflects uh, the community of men. All right. Yeah, I'll jump right in. For me, men's health, I mean, kind of reverse your question. I think it's important because of uh, men are the pillars of community. And so when, when we don't stand in the community, what happens is the community, community begins to fall. And so our, our health, our mental health, our physical health is that important. And, but when, you, when I hear the word, when you talk about men, especially men of color and health, what I normally hear is uh, excuses mm. on why we can't do it instead of how we can do it. Thank you. Uh, for me, uh, truthfully, when I hear men's health, I thought of the magazine, and then those <laughs> ideas brought up like physical health, making sure you're fit, what you eat, and what you put into your body. Um, but as I've grown older and the work that I do now, it's uh, it's mind, body, and soul. So it's like everything we're doing. It's what we're putting into ourselves as, mu as much as what we're putting out into the world. And like everybody's already uplifted. It's sometimes, it's, most of the times, it's neglected as a man because you got to keep going, and that's where that physical health that re like really takes priority just in my personal view. Word, my man is a world, wait, a, a record holder? And go ahead, brag on yourself real quick, get it right. I hold the indoor national record for Puerto Rico in the shot put. Yeah, there we hey. go. Oh, God. Well, that's an interesting <laughs> fact. All right. Oh, God. Word. Um, I'm gonna build on what you just said. So first thing that comes to mind, I actually I pictured that magazine in my head too, but I think about mind, body, and soul. And I think there's also, there's a narrative that we as men, especially black men, kind of fall into when we think about health and just think it's really just about physical. And we have to pay, take time to pay more attention to um, the mind and the mental aspect of it because um, a brother said earlier that it's hard being a man. I'm gonna build on that and say it's just hard being a black man. Mm. It's even harder being a black man, right? So um, with that, I just think about, uh, I feel like every day we as black men, we're, we're stressed like to the max. It could be, your kids, it could be issues with your lady, it could be school stuff, it could be work stuff. Um, it could just be the fact that you're a black man, you gotta deal with just all the pressures and everything that comes with that. So um, there's good stress, there's bad stress. And I know for me, um, even coming here is like, all right, I'm pressed for time, let me get here. That's stress, but it's good stress. Even sitting on this panel, can, you can be nervous, it's stress, it's good stress, but um, it's just how you decide to go about attacking each and every day for me, I know when I get up and go to the gym in the morning, I'm gonna be my best self. I'm, 
I'm ready to just deal with the day. And that's one of the things I do to just make sure I keep my, my health in check uh, to help me be my best self. Word. Appreciate that. Okay. So, we're going to start. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to start with you again, uh, Brother it. Daniel. And, and work our way back <laughs> down this time. So, what would you say are the biggest issues that men face in our community? And are they systematic or internal? And do we make things worse? Ooh. Now, Sherman, you know it's a slew, a slew, a slew of issues that we face. Um, I know somebody's going to comment on it, so I'll just throw it out there. Now, I would say one of the biggest issues that men face um, is just um, dealing with past traumas. And I would say one of, one of the biggest ones is just your daddy issues. Um, as a young professional that works with young males of color, and you see it, all the time, it's a conversation that we wind up having constantly in regards to the impact of not having a positive male role model in your life, not having your father in your life, or not, maybe not knowing who your father is, not having a, a good relationship with um, your father, um, how that impacts you coming up and how it can impact all your relationships going forward. And I got a feeling it's gonna come up later, so I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. Um, wow, okay, to add on to that, um, I would also say Oh, wow. It's a whole bunch of things. It's hard to just pinpoint a couple, but I guess to add off to what Daniel said, um, having a father in your life that's not the role model you need, mm. I think that's also like looking to men who are not the role models you need, but the, the role models that you have in front of you. Um, and then I think beyond that is just like as black men, the system of the systems that are created to just target us for being men. And then to see their ancestors spoke up, and now that we have this like this empowerment, this this basis and foundation to speak up for ourselves, is also another way for us to get targeted. I think that um, it's so much beyond. It's so much uh, added with addition of what's systematic, and then what we go through internally. And then that's my piece right there. Thank you. Well, Sherman, I think first of all, you say we we got to say it's systematic because we know about, especially for black men, we know about slavery. We know how. It, it goes all the way back to you know 1619 and forward, and so even now as we deal with uh, uh, the issues of just being black in America, we we deal with you know the George Floyd's and all the stuff we see and we internalize it and it devalues us over time, and so well so often we find that we have to continually refill ourselves in places where maybe our white counterparts don't have to do it, and so but but leading it back to what we're saying we we're talking about fathers is that. We have to understand we are, we are dealing with fathers who have gone through that, and so for various reasons and various issues that they, you know, they, are, they, are, they are there or not there, or partially there or, or just, you know, just not around. But I think all those pieces uh, come together, but I, I want to also kind of go in a little deeper and say that I think as men, we have to also understand that it's not just our mental health, it's the mental health of all of our young brothers around us. Mm. And so how do we make sure that not just they're, that we're okay, that they're okay also? Because when they become okay, guess what? They feed back into you and you become okay. Appreciate that. Yeah. I forget the whole question, but I see the word issues, so I think I got <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave the fatherhood piece alone for now. And I, but I think one of the two things that I'm thinking about is stigma you know, around mental health related issues and men in general. In fact, I was just meeting with a young guy yesterday and he, he's having some mental health issues and he kind of danced around, oh, I know I can go get therapy or whatever, but I don't really think I need it. I'm like, yo, it's nothing wrong with it. Nah, so I had to, I had to, um, de, what did I say? It's not demystify, but j just take the shame away from seeking help um, around therapy. And I think the fact that I was another black man that it helped him realize oh it's normal it's okay and i, I think now more than ever it's, it's a lot more normal than it might have been in the past but i think just the, the stigma um and also you know another issue is just asking for help mm. right so th this brother came down we talked for a minute and he you know he didn't necessarily say he needed help with mental health issues i i can't help him anyway because I, I ain't a mental health professional <laughs> but but just having conversations and letting somebody else i need help because I know other people or other programs that he needs to get plugged into. Um, but just reaching out for help, I think, is, is an issue sometimes. Cool. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, man. They said a lot. Um, in the shower, I was listening to Plies featuring Kevin Gates. 
and it's called All of the Above. Uh, <laughs> so I want to say it is All of the Above. Um, it is uh, systemic or structural. And I think for many people, if you do not uh, grow up with any type of knowledge of that, it's hard to give it that place. Mm. And because we grow up in uh, America and uh, we have uh, rugged individualism, you know what I'm saying? We look for it to be put solely on our backs. And I think that goes for uh, just being a man, period. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like the final buck stucks with us. And so even though uh, all of these different factors are in the way, we just uh, put it on our back. Um, also, um, there's a quote. Um, I think I heard it uh, from Will Smith once. But he said, although it's not our fault, it's our responsibility to take care of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And that uh, idea of accountability um, is very nuanced. And I think that um, growing up in America, again, it goes into pointing on the individual and uh, how do we have a nuanced conversation um, where it is uh, there's a spectrum of there's responsibility and actions that we can take and that we can improve ourselves. But then how does it go up the ladder to now we have community? So like when I think of self-care or um, taking care of yourself, you know, I think uh, people kind of overdo it. And it's put people into like these silos mm. of trying to take care of themselves. And I think we lose uh, how we're supposed to heal as a community. And um, and uh, because of uh, the systemic pressures that have been uh, brought upon the black community and has uh, broken us down, many of uh, my generation and younger, uh, we forget or we have never known how when uh, my parents and grandparents, how the neighborhood helped each other out, how your neighbor mm. could give you a whooping or they could, uh, help take you to the hospital if you needed to, or they can, you know what I'm saying? So that sense of, of community and being able to help out uh, is lost um, yeah. in, in many ways. And so how do we go and look at the full spectrum, take responsibility for what we, we can do, but then start to open the conversation of, there are some issues that we cannot handle on our own. Oh. And how do we as a team start to, uh, creatively and strategically uh, move forward so that we can solve these problems. Because it is, it is uh, so possible for us to solve. And I serve a very big God. Hey. And I know that together that we can do these things if we can look at it from a new perspective. I appreciate that. We're going to stick with you again and work our way back down. Yes, sir. So kind of the same thing, but just focusing on like our young people and our babies, all of you brothers work with the babies in one capacity or another. So what do you think the biggest issue our young people, particularly our young brothers are facing um, in community? Some of y'all kind of alluded to it, but more specifically for the young men, what, what the issues do you see them facing? Mm. Jesus. Um, and Man, that's a, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> um, uh, my day job, I run the Grant Street Neighborhood Center for uh, Push Buffalo on the west side. And being on the west side, um, I also work with a lot of uh, immigrant and uh, refugee communities. And um, I will say that it feels sort of like uh, social media, how you can find your niche. I like Facebook. I like TikTok. I like Twitter. I like Snapchat that the, uh, the issues are heavy and they can be uh, siloed. So the impact of our mental health or the uh, impact of violence may look similar, but it's like in its own strand. And so like some of my young people, uh, African-Americans, how they were affected from 514 uh, was very different than like the immigrant and refugees where they've come from some war-torn places and you know people die they've been living this life and so the uh the uh issues uh, uh can be different and so um for african americans i think um uh our mental health our our family structures the breakdown 
um, that we have and the uh, uh, the issues that that we're already up uh, that we grew up with are, are very prevalent. So mental health, education, not having family, those different things are very big. And um, then now more so in these late 2000s and uh, with the immigrants coming in, now they have those uh, issues and then you're mixing with uh, other um, cultures and countries. Mm. And like there's rules that they have that we don't have. There's shootings and stabbings at high schools that it's there's new uh problems that maybe us as uh, elders have not faced because we didn't grow up with the 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 uh different uh, nationalities and people from different countries and so that intermixing has its own thing where they're like you know now we got this this uh beef of you know what i'm saying like when i was growing up you know it was like african booty scratcher you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying so they have that where they're not we're we're black and americans and like we're trash but like they're not black enough and then we look at whatever things that are different in their culture and we point it out then for the immigrants and refugees themselves then them trying to if their parents don't speak english and they speak english so they got to skip school to go help them uh sign paperwork or you know get their uh different cards so that they can work or medicare or things of that nature and so it's like all of these different issues just seem to be colliding at the same time and seems to be exacerbated after COVID. And like, it just feels like a heaviness of all of that happened at the same time. And we don't have a compassion. It also feels like there's a lack of compassion. They don't see value in each other's lives. And if there is any difference, that difference can make a, a mile and make them be like, you turn into the other, even if we look the same, get discriminated the same and on all those other things. Word. Appreciate you, Brother Antoine. Uh, I need to question issues, one more time. Issues <laughs> our young people are facing. All right, so so I'm a little different, um, <laughs> or I feel a little different on the panel because I because for the most part we work with older guys in the community. But I was a young person, and I and I I, I kind of watch what's going on around our community. And like I was just saying, I, I literally just talking to a young dude yesterday about mental health, just life stuff. Um, one of the things that I think is lacking is a sense of identity and guidance, right? Like just having parents who can step up and be parents, right? Not be friends, none of that. Just, you know, guiding and loving on their kids, whether we're talking about moms or dads. Um, The other thing that I'm thinking about is identity. So I think now more than ever, there's a lot of options, right? People can be whoever they wanna be. And I think in some ways it's confusing, right? Am I a guy, am I a girl, am I, Sad, one minute, happy. Like, it's, it's just so many options. I, I think that it, it can become overwhelming. And so that kind of, that brings me back to, like, the guidance piece. Like, who who's helping to impart a sense of identity and direction in my life, right? And, and let alone everything else we talked about around the mental health stuff and men specifically, we're not, we don't want to be vulnerable or transparent with people about how we're feeling and stuff like that because it makes us feel like less of a man, or at least that's the way I feel about it sometimes, right, just personally. Um, and so just being, um, having a sense of identity, having direction from people who, is, who really love and care about us, again, whether it's mom or dad, um, yeah, and, 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 and purpose. I think a lot of times, whether you're young or old, Lacking a sense of purpose and direction for your life can cause a lot of anxiety, right? Um, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it right there. But just just those things really stuck out to me when you asked the question. Appreciate that. <clears throat> I have the advantage of uh, having uh, of seeing probably three generations of young people, and, and and this generation is a little bit different than the one before and the one before that. And I think this generation, what they lack is, they've lacked, uh, I won't say, I say touch, but not the touch, you know, that's on TV. <laughs> All right, we, we talk about the, 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 the ability to, because they have, everything is virtual. Mm. So what happens is they don't have now, they don't get the, the touch of the hands or hug. And I noticed the brothers that we all came in today, we all hit each other and hit each other up and whatever. You can't get that virtually. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it misses something. So just being in the same room and the same context with what I'm seeing with young people is you get a chance of the, hearing their real heart. 
what, what they're passionate about, what they're not passionate about, uh, what are those things that, that's plaguing them. Sometimes it's those things that they're afraid of, they just somewhere where they can voice it and you can tell them that, that they're, they're bigger than that. You know, you can get over that, you can work. And, and I think a lot of times, even with mental health, is that even as men, very rarely do we hear somebody tell us we can do it. You know, mm. only time we hear that is when we, you know, we're on the basketball court or we're on the football field. We got a coach that tells us, but then when we leave the football field, nobody's telling us we can make it in life. And, and so I think our young people now, they do not have a core of people around. Going back to what you were saying before about community, I remember, uh, see, we, I'm way back, we used to go home for lunch. And, you know, we would walk home for lunch, uh, you know, lunch, and on your way home, you saw Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Brown, whatever, Mr. Well, you saw a lot of Mrs. because all the brothers were at work. And so you didn't see them until 3 o'clock. Mm. But the whole community know who you, knew who you were, and you had an obligation kind of to the community because they saw you, they talked to you, they, you, you lived with them. And, and now what you find with our young people is they don't have a sense of community. They don't have that, those, I guess it was it, I'm going to call it community wraparound services. Uh, where they don't have to pay for <laughs> and so now we, we, we have to actually go back there as I think as men and as even as we're having conversation man to man I think we also have to begin including our young men into those conversations and our young ladies yeah thank you I definitely agree <clears throat> excuse me I definitely agree with um what's been said I think in my experience uh, and where I work the biggest issues young uh, the young folks are facing um, is uh, opportunity to like I mean, the the opportunity to grasp the opportunities. Um, they're too busy having to speed up their childhoods, mm -hmm. to be actual adults, to su support their own families, or their mothers or their sisters. So they're losing those years of actually being a child and developing and being able to learn and be free. And they're do they turning to wherever they need to. They got to hustle to make money. They got to hustle to support their families. They got to hustle to just to mm -hmm. survive. You know what I mean? So um. That's what I see our young folks as uh, one of the biggest issues is that they're, they're losing out on their time to live, to grow, and they're just being forced to, uh, to adapt and survive. And I definitely, I think support's a huge one, even from my own experience. Um, the way I grew up, uh, it was, I had to find support outside the house and I had to look for other people. And I had great grandparents, but they were never as close as I needed them to be. So that male role model that I wanted in the house was always angry and abusive, and so I had to look out, and that's why I turned to the gym. The gym was my, my safe space because those men poured into me. They're like, well, mm. don't just quit because you couldn't do it this time. Let's like work harder so you can get it to it next time. And then that was the support system that Mr. McClam, Tommy's talking about. Um, Mr. Like, McClam? Yeah, I know Mr. McClam. Okay. Okay. Got shows <laughs> like, you know, I'm a Southern boy, so you know, he's so respect. <laughs> um, but that was, my, that was my support system, that was my community. That's who, that was who poured into me. They would always rip on me for not doing good in school. If I missed a lift, well, why aren't you here? You know, lateness is a form of disrespect. They said, if you're on time, you're late. So it was just reinforcing. Those, those men reinforced those ideas. And that's where I, like, that's where I you know, got to grow and learn, is having that support system. But our young folks these days, they're just thrown in the mix, and it's either do or die. Do or die. Survival of the fittest. <clears throat> to build on. I forgot to, where we was at. That's that damn track. Right? Uh, to build on. We know you coming with the right? train, bro. Go ahead and drive your home. train. Say what? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Go and drive your train, bro. <laughs> we good. Uh, to build on some of what, what has been said here regarding issues uh, facing young people. Um, Myself and one of the in individuals on this panel talk about this often, um, and it's been alluded to already. There's a, there's a huge disconnect between home, school, and community. Um, the village that was present when I, when I was growing up as a teenager is, not, is no longer the village that um, mm -hmm. we have now for, for our young people. Um, they are being forced to grow up much faster than I was when I was coming up as a young person. They are overly sensitized with uh, information, whether it be information on social media, whether it be information um, in school that they don't really care to grasp or learn. Um, and that's the educational system that 
our young people are um, forced into doesn't help this either. Uh, we know that the public public school education wasn't designed for us to uh, thrive and be successful um, individuals. It was designed for us to basically find jobs and crank out widgets. Mm -hmm. um, so now you have young people in spaces where they don't want to go. They don't feel um, invited and they're being forced to learn information that they're really not interested in. Um, and then you have some of the issues that you have in schools where behaviors are manifesting themselves and these high rates of suspensions. Um, the way that we teach young people has to shift. The way that we decide to go about educate, educating young people in these public school institutions has to, has to shift. Um, with the, the onset of social media has allowed, as I think uh, one of the brothers said, um, allowed young people to put out false personas of who they really are or who they think they are. Mm -hmm. um, it also um, pushes these narratives of who society think they should be. Um, I love hip hop, but hip hop today is also influencing the hearts and minds of how young people move and navigate. Um, so it's, there's a host of issues, but just going back to that, that disconnect, and you guys really touched on it in a couple of different ways. Um, these single-headed households, whether it be male or female, that's taking care of young people. You, you know, you got parents that are working two or three jobs, therefore you got a young person, if they have their siblings at home, they're the person that has to either rush home, be late for school, and taking care of their siblings. Um, community, we don't have the as uh, I think Tommy alluded to, dads, dads and men were coming home from work at three, four o'clock, um, and then they were present in community. We, we don't see that now. Um, where, you know, I think even everybody else on this panel right now, we get tagged and asked to do a million different things. We can't be everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. So you gotta figure out how to build that back into community. And one of the things that you have to do is you gotta build that in the young people. Um, problem there is, our young people don't have that sense of work ethic that was kind of instilled into, I know it was instilled into my generation, generations before, but that just core set of values and guiding principles that some of you guys mentioned earlier is just not there in our young people. So somehow we gotta figure out to get back some of those old school methods of raising our children in the community so that um, we can get back to being um, the, the village that we know we can be. Appreciate you. Davon, you want yeah. to chime in real quick? I'm Thank you. you uh, real quick, there's a couple of things that, that popped up that I wanted to add is um, a lot of it is uh, systemic issues that our, our youth are uh, dealing with. And um, when we try to come up with uh, solutions, um, the solutions are patchwork. And um, so it's like, uh, we're going to we're gonna build on the east side and we're gonna give some people uh, money and we're just gonna throw some new houses there. That particular area may not need new houses. You know, um, maybe it needs a museum or a dance studio or maybe it needs something else, but people take like the popular ideas of what they think is working or sometimes the evidence-based solutions that are supposed to be working and then they just throw it into a situation and it doesn't work for everybody and like i want to take that back to the long term uh, that i mentioned uh, earlier in the check-in is a part of the long term is re-evaluating and rechanging our strategic uh plan um and approach and i think mental health i think is great that we have a lot of like social workers and um that our kids my godson has a very strong vocabulary and command of how he's thinking and what he's going through. And he's been through some rough stuff. And um, his ability to be able to articulate it is amazing. But also, in the same school, you have some kids who can't, they're just angry and they don't know how to. Mm. So it's like only certain people can take advantage or to learn. And um, so I think that goes to that, uh, that, patwork, that patchwork and then uh, like, uh, Daniel was saying, I was like, I feel like there is a strong lack of creativity within our educational space. And also, I think there is a, there is a, I think there's a fear from how corporations have dealt with their employees. There is a fear to take a risk to do something different because your ass may be on the line. Yep. 
And so although you may see you have a heart or you want to do something, it's like, well, now I got to think I got these student loans. I just bought this house. Like, can I personally take this risk to save these young people who I care about? And then it's also like, man, but if they cut me off, now I got a whole different world of problems to deal with. And so how do we deal with having um, a different sense of accountability and accountability that comes with a level of grace so that when you are doing something wrong, it's just not like, yo, we're going to look for the chopping board and then we're going to look for the next new idea again. Appreciate you. All Appreciate right. So, Trump, can I jump, just well, jump hey, on the tail end of that? Is that uh, this is, uh, as we were talking, I was thinking just last night, a uh, brother sent me this. He says, uh, just, a, just a little text. I'm on E, tired, confused, emotionless, unsure, lost. I have no clues what to do except for what needs to be done. And uh, he just lost his brother. Uh, but this gentleman here is, he's a exec of a major nonprofit, national nonprofit. Mm. And he's shooting this at whatever, 10, 11 o'clock at night because he doesn't have anybody to call and he's in another state. Mm. And I think that, that we're waiting for the Calvary to come and we are the Calvary. And so uh, and nobody else is coming. And so we're gonna have to figure out how do we do that? And so, and become uh, kind of wounded healers mm. that while we're still mm -hmm. limping that we're gonna still help each other. And then that brother can help me and we keep changing each other band-aids until finally we both heal. Yes. Okay, I love that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're gonna pivot just a little bit. Uh, shout out to the Pivot Podcast. Hey. So um, it's brother Daniel, now, do you think there's an unfixable gap between the expectations of men and women? 2023, is there an unfixable gap between the expectations of men and women? Ooh, so when we talk about expectations between men and women, what exactly are we, are we talking about in relationships? Are we talking about... Tommy, stop looking at me like that. <laughs> I'm about to say, how, however you want to interpret it, I left it vague on purpose. <laughs> I left it vague on purpose, however you want to interpret it, brother. Um, mm. Expectations are a funny thing. Um, I think it's good to have expectations, right? Because it gives you something to strive for, but I guess the right word there isn't necessarily expectations, it should be goals, right? Um, and as long as you have goals, you're always striving for something, even if you don't necessarily achieve them. Um, there is a lesson learned in failure. Um, but when it comes to, I think sometimes unfair expectations may be set um, in certain arenas. Um, but it's also I, there's a there's an accountability factor in there as well. It's like if you as a man or woman know that you cannot meet the expectations set um, upon or desired by another individual, then you have to take accountability and communicate that um, and figure out which way you're going to go. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm going to leave that there because. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping he's gonna continue, so I had more time to think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Tag, you're <laughs> um, uh, unfixable gap between expectations in 2023 between men and women. Um, I think there's. I think just like certain things are really hard to combat, that this uh, quote unquote expectations that us men have, um, I don't think, I think it's hard to combat. It's just like, w ooh, damn. No, I don't think it's fixable. I think it's unfixable. Okay. I'm just saying that, but there. Okay. I gotta pick a side. Um, I definitely think it's unfixable because um, though the world is changing and there's so many options on what you can be and how identify and what is what nowadays, I think that the people who are still on a binary track are still cons like still thinking that men are supposed to be providers one way um, 
and you know, do this, this, and that, and fix things. And it may not be just as simplistic as that binary thought process, but it, there's ideologies embedded in that where the men are the fixers, the providers, and they don't get the support that their their partners will get to be inclusive. Their partners will get. Um, and I think that as, as men grow up too, it's that same ideology. Like it's who else is around you? Machismo is a real thing. I'm an Afro Latino, so machismo. You, you got to be a big man all the time. So like, I don't like fighting, but I stand like I got it ready. Like you want it. Like what my, my boss says, stay ready so you don't got to get ready. Mm -hmm. So I stay ready so I don't got to get ready. But I hate fighting, right? Um, but it's the idea of how I grew up. My dad was a fighter. So he, I remember one time he said, if the homie comes up, you got to swing him on the bat when I'm fighting. And I'll never forget that because I didn't want to do it. And I didn't have to do it, luckily. But it's that mentality that mm -hmm. some young people grow up with with the people that are their role models mm. and even like with my mom like it's like okay she taught me like as a man you got to walk on the opposite side of this or no on the the side or the street side and she has to walk on the inside it's like cultural mm. things so like i learned good things to when i'm engaging with women and certain aspects from my mother but i also learned bad attributes from my dad on how to be a man so i think that those expectations are always going to be there and they're unfixable just because that's the way the world is right now Appreciate that. Mm. For, for me, I think the gap, it, I, I, I disagree with I think it can be fixable. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, the other piece is, is that where you begin working on the gap, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of times we want to jump in the middle of the bridge and start working in the middle of the bridge and nothing to hold on to. And, and uh, I, I do a lot of work with couples. And, and one of the things that I see is that so often you come to the table and we want to be together, we're going to hook up, whatever but I don't know who I am, which mm. goes back to that mental health. I don't even know who I am. So just the odds of me choosing the right person and I don't even know who I am, mm. the odds of me doing that is slim and none. Mm. Right? And, and so I think that the, to fix that gap, it's almost kind of, we have to peel back to the place where, uh, I'm just gonna talk about the brothers for right now. I ain't gonna talk about the sisters, but <laughs> the, the brothers, we just need to realize, step back and find out who we are, uh, what we are, what we believe in, where's our mindset. Uh, when we understand who I am, then mm -hmm. I know what I need. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I see a sister and as a sister I see, okay, that sister has what I need to make me whole and I can bring something to the table for her life also. And I think so often what we do, we miss is figuring out who we are. And most of us don't figure out who we are until after we done made that selection. And then after we made the selection, we spend the next 10 years trying to spin around in that selection, triggering we gonna get in or get out. And, and that starts a whole new sense of mental illness. Mm. Mm. Appreciate that. Mm. Yeah, that was, mm. yeah, he was talking to me. <laughs> Word. <laughs> okay. You got to run it back for me. I'm a little slow today. No, it's um, all good. It's all good, brother. Um, so is there an unfixable gap between men and women in, in 2023? So, so after listening to um, Devon and PT and Daniel, I'm going to say yes in my perspective. Okay. No, 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 there's, there's not an unfixable gap. That, okay. That's the way I want to answer okay. it. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I think that there are a lot of things related to men and narrative around like j just a generalization of men that won't ever go away. Right. And, and, and piggybacking off of um, the word provider that Devon used, I think that that provider, the, the, the head of the household, um, you know, not head of the household, but 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 the, but the man is ahead, whatever, right? We get we could look at whether biblical or not biblical, and and I, I say that, and regardless of whether or not people um, would say he's the he's the man of the house or he's the head, he's the head of the house, at the end of the day, I think that somebody is always going to be to blame, right? Like so, with the, whether things are going good or whether things are going bad, somebody is always going to be to blame, and it could be whether he's there in the household or not in the household. <laughs> Um, I think that a lot of times men are demonized um, because of the larger like statistics and stuff. So you look at victimization and, and criminalization, whatever. A lot of times those things are perpetuated by men. And I'm not trying to justify the stuff that we do just, just as, as, a, as a man. But I think because of those stats that we're just looked at in a certain way. And don't talk about a black man, because then it's e even more so, right? We don't got to do nothing to be looked at as a threat, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we look at gaps and expectations. It's like when, th when, when, it's, when it's time for, 
you know, somebody to, to, to take responsibility for something we just say is bad, whatever, or negative, then we're looking at what, what did he do, right? <laughs> um, I think very, very seldom are we, are we looking at women necessarily in terms of being a person who messed up or whatever. I think there's a lot more grace for our women than it is for our men. Um, and yeah, so, so that's why I say what I say around the expectation and gap, but just, just around that whole responsibility piece and, and, and societal norms. Appreciate that. All right. Oh man, I've been waiting for this one, man. <laughs> um, so, uh, one, again, I want to say that, uh, I serve a big God. So the, yes, it is fixable period, point blank. And wherever you stand at agnostic, if you believe in the universe, whatever the case is, there is so much abundance and life and love that is just uh, outside of our view. It can, and I believe will be fixed. Um, oh my goodness, it's so much. Uh, adults don't know how to heal. Mm. Hurt people. Hurt adults people. don't know how to heal. One thing that I love about working with youth and even remembering as a youth, is we could fight at Delaware Park, and then we would come back and be cool, and we would, we would pick each other on the same squad. Uh. Adults do not do that. Um, there is a, uh, what did I put? It's like, it's interesting. Um, when we think about youth, and we think, if we think about uh, young people like a new computer, uh, they're not filled up. They don't have all these tabs open, all these windows open. They haven't been used for years. They haven't needed mm. to be rebooted, rebooted or things like that. But when we become adults, we are handling all of that. And a lot of times, I feel, when we look at these issues, we're not thinking about uh, that gap. You know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking about relationship-wise. Where, where can we get together relationship-wise? That the other pressures that are on me are affecting that I can't show up even if I wanted to know myself. I can't even show up as my full self because all of this stuff is on me. And a lot of times in our community, in the black community, the family is broken. So I haven't had an example. I haven't had a way to navigate, to do these things. You know what I'm saying? So uh, there's so much in it. And again, it's a very uh, American thing to look at the, uh, the celebrity, to look at what is sexy, to look at the easy answers, to go with the narratives. And then it's like, oh, well, all, all men are this, and all men are that. And um, that, when you said narrative, before you said narrative, I wrote down, uh, I believe when uh, Daniel was talking, I was like, the, uh, what are some of the false things that we, that we hear about that we know about? When they say like, uh, black men aren't good fathers, one, statistically, we're the best. Amen. Period. When they go and look at the, like, it is documented. This is not even, you know what I'm saying? You can go and Google it and you can see statistically we show the most love that even when white people spend more time with their kids, it's not quality time. It's not building that relationship. And because we are so cognizant, because we have so much, and sometimes because that kid is the only person that will love us, we will sit there and make sure they get the Jordans. But we're doing more than just the Jordans. We are building a bond with them. Like, yo, we, we matching Jordans. Like, you got my fly. You have that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're building something more than that. So those narratives are so strong and so persuasive and are in our media and are in our movies and are in all of those things that, like the information that we have today, that are, is at our t fingertips, that is in our phones, that we are overwhelmed, that it's hard for us to take a step back and be like, we can uh, do this. Um, so how do we heal? Then it's like real conversations. How many of us men really take time to have conversations with other black men that may not necessarily be like us? So I went to City Honors, but I also played football. So I had the privilege of being with the dorks and accept it, but also I was sweet at football and it was undeniable. You know what I'm saying? And also I had these hands. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about Goku and Pokemon and then I'm gonna whoop you and then you got, you got beat by a City Honors dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So having that, but because I understand that that experience is uh, not shared by everyone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now we go into there's, there's a lot of different nuances. So I tried my hardest not to, and I was just having a conversation with my friend, I tried not to throw these blanket statements. Because if you did play sports, one, if you play sports, there's uh, uh, experience that you've had with women that if you don't play sports, you don't understand. Let alone, if you are good, 
<laughs> when I went to UB, I played for UB. It was thrown at me. You know what I'm saying? Now, when I go the other way, when I go into my friends that uh, from City Honors, and we were doing hacky sack, and we were going out to countries and climbing trees and jumping in ponds or whatnot, some of them did not touch a girl, smell a girl, think about a girl until they got into their 20s. Mm. And so the experience to even be like, they're all the same. And now let alone let you be black and now you're a black nerd or you're an Oreo or you're dealing with all of these different things. And then you get into this, you try to get into a, a relationship and have this talk. It's like the, the expectation is so much wider. The, the, um, the gap is so much bigger because the experience is different. And if you do not come from that experience, if you don't come correct or whatever the case is, you know what I'm saying, then people can diss you, people can hurt you, and then hurt people start to hurt people. Yeah. So it's like, how do we start to, when we have this conversation, how can we have this conversation with a, uh, a level of, of nuance, mm -hmm. a level of humility that my experience is not the only experience, mm -hmm. and that... Uh, if I've, especially if I've had kind of the same experience over and over and over, then I may be the common denominator. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. the one thing that I like about being a guy is like, we had to be hunters, right? You gotta be hunters and you gotta switch up how you do these things. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I am passionate about saving the world. I am not passionate about Jordans. Um, I am not, I love my sports, but I'm not super passionate about that. So I had to figure out what was the way that I can get numbers, right? Now for me, it was being quiet. I'll just take my phone out. They put a number in. I was like, okay, we can do that. My cousin Mike, he's funny. Gift the gab. Funny gets him all the time. You know what I'm saying? But I had that experience. Now, that's me hunting and looking and like, okay, how do I change? I can experiment. When I get rejected, I can handle the rejection because I've had so much. Now you go with somebody that had no rejection. And when they get into it or they get into their first love or their first heart, and they'd be like, they were so good. They, they've never hit nobody or whatnot. But that was their 20 years. They've waited. They've dreamed. They've put their whole heart into this. And then somebody ripped it. And then they <laughs> went berserk. They didn't know they had that inside of them. You know what I'm saying? So people are given these experiences. And really, they are so dynamic and so different. And like for athletes being at UB, one thing that... Uh, that we experience is one women will hunt us they know our mm. they know our stats they know what our favorite food is uh they know our moms or whatnot they like oh you might go to the nb yo green bay is looking at you you know what i'm saying so it's like now we come you get into this thing and then like you're kind of scared like yo like let me fall back or i don't want to go out so much or i can't because if something happened news is ready and then my life could be ended so it's like all of these experiences are so different but when we get into it, we kind of get triggered. And this will be my last thing. I'm sorry that I'm speaking long. This will be my last thing. We kind of get triggered. And when we start to give these defenses, I think what is very hard for adults across the board, we tie our identity to our arguments. And we get personally offended when somebody doesn't agree or think with us like, what do you mean? No, we don't do all this. Like, hold on. No, no some people are terrible. They do do that. They do do that. And it's like, how can you... Um, how can you separate that so you can have the conversation where you don't get the up, uh, the emotions and get all of that? And it'd be like, oh man, I can start to see. And it's like, a lot of times with anything, like traveling, if you go and travel and you get in different countries and cultures and you see different things, it's like, it opens up your eyes. Like, oh, we don't have, disrespect. You stepped on my shoes, disrespect. You go, you go to China and it's billions of people you and McDonald's, and there's no lines. It's like a group that's just shifting up. Okay. People stepping on your shoes. Nobody's getting mad and trying to kill somebody over their shoes. Different culture. A different thing. My man, thank you for cutting me yep, off. Yep, yep. No, it's all good. Because <laughs> I want to I wanna get to, like, the solution part. So y'all.